speaker today will be Dr. Um, Al Rashid. Uh, Dr. Turki Al Rashid is the founder and CEO of Golden Grass uh, Incorporated, which is an agriculture and contracting company based in Saudi Arabia. He's an adjunct professor at the College of Agriculture and Life Science at the Department of Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, moreover, he's also an advisor to the Environment and Sustainable Development Unit here at the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences at the American University of Beirut. Dr. Al-Rashid has authored more than half a dozen books and his most recent publication is on public govern governance and strategic management capabilities, public gov uh, governance in the Gulf states. Dr. Uh, Turki Al-Rashid, uh, please uh, help us with your perspective. Good morning, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Eid Mubarak. Uh, thank you, Martin, for arranging uh, such a, a very vital, important uh, topic. My uh, topic is food security, Saudi Arabia COVID-19 challenges. Well, first of all, food security is not only about food. It is all about national security, chronic hunger, threatening individual, threatening government, societies and border. Food security strategy locally in Saudi Arabia is a priority now. The local agriculture provides 30% of the food consumption. Saudi Arabia currently depend 85% of their food import. Four-fifths of the planet, 7.8 billion mouth, depend on food import in 2020. Let's just look at it in 20 years. Food trade went from $500 million to $1.5 trillion. That is three times higher. What is the pandemic impact? The vulnerability of Saudi food, supply chain distributions and the network. We need to support local farmer and local food production. Panic buying of food supply has caused shortage in the food in many countries. Luckily, Saudi Arabia was an exemption because it happened before the month of Ramadan and Hajj. Food supply usually it's abundant at that time. Romania, Russia, Kazakhstan, Vietnam have restricted export of food. What are the pandemic challenges? The globalization and the liberalization of the economy work very well, but in normal condition. In time of crisis, swift changes, demand for safety and the well-being of the citizen. We need to decentralize the manufacturing to move away from a rigid centralized supply system. Big supermarkets currently control the bulk of food supply and market. We need to support small scale food production and retail system that can supply the local uh, community. Let's look at Saudi agriculture business. It contributed $14 billion annually, that's about 3.4% of the non-oil GDP, 900,000 workers in that sector. The total agriculture holding is about 346,000. The number of farms is about 262,000. Animal herd fish farm is about 85,000. Let me summarize what I want to say. So permission to Saudi national to deliver food supply have make it easier for a lot of people. Example, my house was done through Jahiz. Local farmers have been hard hit on the Corona uh, virus pandemic, despite the government assistance. The Saudi supply chain need to adapt to the new system of diversification and simplicities to the new reality. We need to increase our food production in a sustainable way. Saudi Arabia will depend on innovation, technology, for example, urban farming. Let me conclude my talk. The implication of food supply chain, many people were unable to secure affordable food. Panic buying has caused food supply in the supermarket to a minimum. Urban farming such as vertical farming, can address some of those issues. I will close my talk. 
sustainable agriculture development is one of the best tools to enhance food security, alleviate poverty, and promote economic growth. I'm happy to take your questions and your comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Turki. And let's ask uh, the next question to our representative from the private sector in Saudi Arabia, Dr. Turki Al Rashid. Um, Dr. Turki, Saudi Arabia has become quite infamous for pursuing a strategy of importing food uh, by investing in overseas agricultural production. Could this strategy be under threat now as food supply chains face pressure to localize as a result of COVID-19? If we look at uh, the Saudi strategy, first of all, I talk in my own uh, capacity. I don't talk on behalf of any other organization that I'm working with or I am associated with. Uh, when Saudi Arabia decided to go for the food securities, the decision was a political decision, as when we were facing threat in the 80s. So the main drive then, it was a political move. Then it became the 2000s when we discover the cost of uh, food production is very high in terms of water. So we could not sustain that uh, system. Then we decided to go into uh, other venue, which is the total productions from different places. Uh, I would appreciate if you could share with us the graph that I have sent you, uh, Martin. So the Saudi decision decided to go with food security. That is uh, the broad term of definition for it, which is uh, it will be using the other stakeholders, like buy stakeholders in other companies, uh, go with the local market, go with the, the, the market uh, derivative, and uh, use a, a very good facility of a storage facilities. Those five, six pillars will give the Saudi the ability uh, to have a free hand in some way. But as we always know, when crisis happened, uh, liberalization, open market, it's a good system only in time of a good time. But when crisis happened, we need to have a certain production of our food locally. Uh, currently, Saudi Arabia, as I said, 85% depend on uh, import. Even though agriculture provides about 30% of our local consumption, but we should always go with at least 30% of our need. It should be grown uh, locally until the crisis uh, disappear or it was easy. As we said in 2007, 2008, when the, cri the financial crisis, it hit at a very bad time. Production was very bad and the storage was very low. At least in this time, we were in a much better position because production was high uh, and the storage facilities everywhere was quite good. So we were not affected as much as we did in the 2007. But to answer your question, we should concentrate at least 30% on our food production, it should be uh, locally. And I think uh, almost like the 30% uh, uh, level, it's quite good for everybody. Even uh, I think there is a strategies from Singapore that's within in 2030, they should have their own uh, production for 30%. And they will use all the technology to achieve that. I hope I answered your questions. Thank you very much. Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Turki Rashid, for your insightful uh, comments on the Saudi Arabia private sector work. And uh, um, let's go back to Saudi Arabia. In the recent uh, decades, uh, Saudi Arabia has shifted its policies promoting domestic agricultural production due to environmental pressures, specifically the over extraction of water resources. 
Dr. Rashid, uh, do you expect that the COVID-19 will provoke any similar shifts in the Saudi Arabia agricultural policies? And how do you think? We realize what's our limitation. What are the strategies? When you do a strategies, you have to uh, look at all your uh, SWOT analysis, what your strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. Our major threat is water scarcities. So we have to work with that, and we have to use technology to overcome that. And the, we need to balance out all our uh, resources. We have to take the full benefits of the market derivative. We have to take the full benefits of partnership. As you could see, we just obtained 29% of one of the largest uh, companies who produce uh, rice in India and uh, Saudi uh, import rice uh, in two kinds of rice. We have we import the white rice, we could import it from anywhere, but mainly Saudi don't eat white rice, they eat only yellow rice, which is the yellow rice is only produced in the Punjab, which is basically India and Pakistan. So we went and we went uh, we bought that 30% or 29%. And then we go to other countries and we buy shareholders with the food production company. Then at the same time, we go direct investment. And we the, and again, we go with Saudi investor and we finance them. Now we know all these things are very good, but it work in a normal condition. But when a crisis hit, you have to be prepared for emergency. And that emergency, we need to depend on our local consumption. I'm very happy with the move now of Saudi Arabia. They have made uh, base base on the on, on the area, like they made an agreement with the EFAT and they go to Jizan and they go to con to area of Saudi Arabia, which is they have a good qualities of water and quite a good water. But the water should be, I mean, irrigation should go by crops per drops. And we need to uh, do as much as we can to reach the 30% on our uh, strategic crops. Saying all that, not to neglect the abilities to uh, storage facility. We must have a good storage facilities to hold us through the crisis. We're lucky that when the COVID come, or hit Saudi Arabia, we were very lucky because it came just before Ramadan and Hajj. And through Ramadan and Hajj, we really, all our supply is abundant. I mean, people are in Saudi Arabia, they could go to the supermarket, supermarket is full of everything you could think of it. And we should give a credit to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia have managed the crisis, one of the fewest countries in the world, have achieved a good success on managing the uh, crisis. Why? Because leaders were ready for it. Every year in Mecca, we have Ramadan and we have Hajj. So every year, you know, leaders, the public are prepared mentally, there is a price could come. So it's not like we go through the denial and then we go said, no, we don't have it. Such like happened, like, Sometimes superpower, they, the ego cover their weakness, like what happened in the US, like what happened in the UK and other countries. So we took a really good measure and the only good people could compare Saudi Arabia, could compare it to uh, South uh, Korea, uh, we, you could compare it to Singapore, uh, Taiwan. Those are the country which is they take the early measure and we were ready, we took the early measure. Could you imagine, I mean, not even in the wildest dream, the king of Saudi Arabia will close Mecca and Medina, will close all the mosques. Those things, they were a very hard decision to make, but we need to make it. And we did make it. So to answer your question, there is no one simple answer. As I said on my graph, we have to look at all the other aspects. We have to buy, we have to grow, we have to use the market derivative, we have to finance Saudis for investment, we have to 
uh, go and partner with food production. So all this will create a sustainable agriculture food security strategies, in my own opinion. Thank you very much, Dr. Turki, uh, for your very important input. Um, the next question goes to Khadim. As, as I've mentioned in my uh, our statement in the Q&A, uh, we are all living in one big village. Globalization uh, was a luxury that no longer is. The MENA region in particular has to collaboratively look inward and focus on nation building. As Dr. Mahmoud said, are they going to put differences aside and focus on nation building? Food is a, a, not a luxury, it is a necessity. Water resources are a serious matter in the MENA region. Will the political will change? Thank you. Thank you very much. Just to briefly add, um, Dr. Salama is a, uh, a former consultant general surgeon from Saudi Arabia, and he's uh, one of uh, uh, Saudi's uh, key health experts. So who would like to answer his question? Perhaps uh, Dr. Turki or Dr. Mahmoud? I'll take I'll take Dr. Salama. First of all, my congratulation and my appreciation, Jazakumallah Al Khair, for all you doctors and all your friends. On the SDGs and the Saudis uh, Vision 2030 and the uh, G20s, the pandemic have put all the 17 SDGs as a second online because no matter what government have a limited resources and they put all their resources on the medicals and the support of the well-being of their societies. However, Saudi Arabia, because it is the president of the G20s, they have allocated and they have press for allocation, if it come out of my memory, more than uh, $500 million to help all the poor uh, countries and the highly affected. So cooperation is a must. And this is one of the major issues that is as the, uh, the G20, which is will be held in November in Riyadh, they will cover this SDGs and it is their priority. But as the crisis happened, it became to be the second priority, not the full priority. The floor is yours, uh, Mohammed. Okay, uh, thank you for giving me the, the chance. Uh, I'm from Lebanon. Can you quickly introduce yourself also to... Okay, I'm an agricultural engineer uh, working with an international NGO. Uh, so, my uh, from Lebanon. So, my... Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Turkey. Mr. Turkey, you were talking about the, the implementation of a sustainable food strategy in, in Saudi Arabia. And it's a really good uh, work, but uh, this strategy should be socially accepted and locals in the region should be ready for it and aware about the importance of uh, the agriculture and agri, uh, agri food sectors in the sustainable development because you know, at the end, you need the human resource as a part of this strategy. So my question is, are you doing any awareness sessions with the, the locals in order to orient them about the importance of the agriculture and the agri-food sectors in the sustainable development? I mean, through universities, school, TV shows. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mohammed, for your questions. Uh, the summary of my book, which is the public governance and strategic management capability, is there is no strategies, not whatsoever, can succeed without the full participations of all the stakeholders. So if any strategies, whether it is a nation building or human building, without the participations, of all the stakeholders, it will not go anywhere. 
we have seen many, many strategy, whether it is a national strategies or a local strategies, it didn't succeed. And the success of any strategy is not something new. If you look at uh, uh, Joseph the Dreamer, uh, Surat Yusuf, Uh, Surah Yusuf السلام, it's all about uh, strategies. You have to look at the three triple bottom line, which is the financial, the, the profits, the prosperity, the people, the planet. If you don't get involved all these three people, three uh, uh, elements at the same time and you get the stakeholders involvement, you will not succeed. So Unless we get involved all the stakeholders, we will never succeed. The top-down uh, approach, it will never succeed. Or using the expertise from outside, as we could see what happened to Iran, the White Revolution, or whether we look at uh, the Russian, when they brought all the expertise from outside, the result was a failure. But if you look at the strategies of Egypt, when they were the highest on the, the death of the children, which is the mortality rate, because they took all the sources locally, they have succeeded and they have lowered the death rate. If you look at Saudi Arabia on their food securities, they have achieved it. If you look at uh, the German of the unifications of Germany, they have succeeded. If you look at the Cuba, which is they got their medical, they have put all their resources and they've succeeded. So if you look at Iran, Russia, the result was uh, a disastrous. But if you look at when you get involved of all the stakeholders, the always the result will prevail. So my answer to you, any strategy must get involved all the other stakeholders. And I hope we are uh, doing it. We should do it more and we should do it more if we want any strategy to succeed. I hope I answered your question. We have another question coming from Uganda by uh, Michael Sigawa. And I think it uh, actually addresses everyone. Um, he asked, the MENA region has the highest levels of sub subsidies in the world, especially for food and energy. There is a widespread argument that food subsidies are unsustainable. For example, consumer subsidies for staple foods, cereals, oils, sugar, in many countries of the promoting unbalanced uh, diets, increasing the risk of malnutrition and health among the population. My question is, should subsidies be eliminated, halved, or maintained? Of course, we have to ask our private sector representative, um, what's your take on subsidies, Dr. Turki? Well, if we talk about subsidies, it's, it's not a matter whether subsidies are not. You have to understand the Arab world are very large number of them is under poverty. They are young. It's how do you use subsidies? If we look at Malawi, uh, Malawi, they have used subsidies and it actually they have converted subsidies from a food beggar into a food exporter. Rather than countries just give them anything, they start to take fertilizer and uh, good quality seed and they start to be a food exporter. So the subsidy must be targeted. Unfortunately, many of the subsidies we have it's like giving uh, subsidized the, the production of uh, oil or uh, the rice. That subsidy doesn't work because you have to be targeted subsidies. In my uh, studies, the one I made on the, on the restructuring the subsidy, it should be targeted, that it should go to the needed. And the first thing you have to realize first is what is the problem? If you deny the problem, then you could never solve the problem. When I was writing about poverty in Saudi Arabia, I've been fighted by almost everybody. Nobody wants to admit that we have poverty. But when Saudi Arabia and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia have decided that we do have poverty and we do have to have address it, 
Then we have launched a program called the citizen account, which is it's a targeted for the needed people. Be surprised, but almost 60% of the Saudi population are enrolled in that uh, program because then you give a targeted people who need it, go for it. It's like giving a medication to everybody and you said, well, I'm giving you a medication. It doesn't work. It got to go to the needed people. And it must be not only a program without evaluation. It has to be evaluated. It has to be monitored. And it has to go to the right amount of the right people. It's like the right medicine for the right doses for the right person. Thank you very much, Dr. Turki. Um, and with your words i'd like to close this uh, seminar or this webinar for today thank you very much everyone for contributing your highly important uh, views on this uh, very urgent subject and